have returned to the God of my childhood, to the same simple faith as a child I once knew, like the prodigal son. I longed for my loved ones, for the comforts of home. And the God I outgrew. I have returned to the God of my childhood, Bethlehem's name, the prophet's Messiah. We have, we have now learned that Jesus is eternal God. Now the mystery of salvation is the fact that eternal God became a man. We read in Philippians 2 verses 5 through 8, Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus, who being in the form of God, thought it not robbery to be equal with God, but made himself of no reputation, and took upon him the form of a servant, and was made in the likeness of men. And being found in fashion as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient unto death, even the death of the cross. So Jesus Christ, eternal God, became a man and humbled himself on the cross. While he was on earth, how did he use his powers? The Zara of Ages 664. The Savior was deeply anxious for his disciples to understand for what purpose his divinity was united to humanity. Why was this divinity and humanity combined? He came to the world to display the glory of God that man might be uplifted by its restoring power. God was manifested in him that he might be manifested in them. Jesus revealed no qualities and exercised no powers that men may not have through faith in him. His perfect humanity is that which all his followers may possess if they will be in subjection to God as he was. We have a video series entitled The Word Was Made Flesh. They go more into this humanity of Jesus Christ. But we just want to study in this lesson a little bit about the process of what was involved. In John 3.16 we are told that God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son that whosoever believeth in Him should not perish but have everlasting life. When God came into this world and became a man and took on the form of a human being, the Godhead was still His own. We read this in Desire of Ages. 663. Christ had not ceased to be God when he became man. Though he had humbled himself to humanity, the Godhead was still his own. While on earth, in page 664 as well, in Desire of Ages, Christ's works testified to his divinity. So the works that he did showed that he was divine. He did not use the divine qualities other than what we are able to use them when we partake of the divine nature. But nonetheless, the divine qualities he showed showed that he was God. Continue on in Desire of Ages. If the disciples believed this vital connection between the Father and the Son, their faith would not forsake them when they saw Christ suffering and death to save a perishing world. Christ was seeking to lead them from their low condition of faith to the experience they might receive if they truly realized what He was. If they understood who He was, they would not have sunk into that depression. And who was He? It says God in human flesh. That is who Jesus was. Bible Commentary, Volume 5, page 1127. 
As a member of the human family, he was mortal. But as a God, he was the fountain of life to the world. He could in his divine person ever have withstood the advances of death and refused to come under its dominion. But he voluntarily laid down his life that in so doing he might give life and bring immortality to life. On page 1127, a couple paragraphs down, the adorable Redeemer stepped down from the highest exaltation. Step by step he humbled himself to die, but what a death. It was the most shameful, the most cruel death upon the cross as a male factor. But he did not die as a hero in the eyes of the world, loathed with honors as men in battle. He died as a condemned criminal, suspended between the heavens and the earth, died a lingering death of shame, exposed to the tauntings and revilings of a debased, crime-loaded, profligate multitude. That's the type of death that Jesus died. Christ was to die as man's substitute. Man was a criminal under the sentence of death for transgression of the law of God. As a traitor, a rebel, hence a substitute for man must die as a malefactor because he stood in the place of the traitors with all their treasured sins upon his divine soul. It was not enough that Jesus should die in order to fully meet the demands of the broken law. But he died a shameful death. The prophet gives to the world his words, I hid not my face from shame and spitting. When we think about the sacrifice of Jesus Christ, when we understand the eternal nature of his divinity and then dying on the cross of Calvary, the reason why we need to study this is to understand our own sacrifice. In consideration of this, can men have one particle of exaltation as they trace down the life and sufferings and humiliation of Christ? Can they lift their proud heads as if they would bear no trials, no shame, no humiliation? When we look at what Jesus did, we don't have a sacrifice. We don't really have anything to hang on to. Christ made that sacrifice. I say to the followers of Christ, look to Calvary and blush for shame at your self-important ideas. All this humiliation of the majesty of heaven was for guilty, condemned man. He went lower and lower in his humiliation until there were no lower depths that he could reach in order to lift man up from his moral defilement. All this was for you who are striving for the supremacy, striving for human praise, for human exaltation, who are afraid you will not receive all that deference, that respect from human minds that you think is your due. Is this Christ-like? Is this the way Jesus was? When we look at Calvary, we'll be able to put all that stuff aside. Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus. He died to make an atonement and to become a pattern for everyone who would be his disciple. Shall selfishness come into your hearts? And will those who set not before them the pattern Jesus extol your merits? You have none except as they come through Jesus Christ. Shall pride be harbored after you have seen deity humbling himself and then as man debasing himself till there was no lower depths to which he could descend? Be astonished, O heavens, and be amazed, the inhabitants of the earth, that such returns should be made to our Lord. What contempt, what wickedness, what formality, what pride, what efforts made to lift man and glorify self when the Lord of glory humbled himself, agonized, and died the shameful death upon the cross in your behalf. When we think about the sacrifice of Jesus, eternal deity, coming into this world to be a human being, it is amazing indeed. Before any creature was created, Jesus offered himself as that sacrifice. We know the verse in Revelation 13, verse 8, the lamb slain from the foundation of the world. But I want to turn your attention to Proverbs chapter 8, verses 22 through 31. Let's evaluate these texts, understand their meaning, and see the tremendous sacrifice of the Son of God. Let us read all these verses together first. Proverbs 8, verse 22 through 31. The Lord possessed me in the beginning of his way, before his works of old. I was set up from everlasting, 
from the beginning or ever the earth was. When there were no depths, I was brought forth. When there were no fountains abounding with water. Before the mountains were settled, before the hills was I brought forth. Well, as yet he had not made the earth, nor the fields, nor the highest parts of the dust of the world. When he prepared the heavens, I was there. When he set a compass upon the face of the depth. When he established the clouds above, when he strengthened the fountains of the deep. When he gave to the sea his decree that the water should not pass his commandment. When he appointed the foundations of the earth, then I was by him as one brought up with him. And I was daily his delight, rejoicing always before him, rejoicing in the habitable part of the earth, and my delights were with the sons of men. Let us evaluate these texts so we can have an understanding heart. And may the Lord be with us as we study this, that we may understand it correctly, rightly dividing the word of truth. Verse 22 begins, The Lord possessed me in the beginning of his way before the works of old. What does the word possessed mean? The word possessed by definition is to create, to erect, to procure, especially by purchase, by implication to own or to attain. Now, our method of Bible study is not always just to look at the definition, because this is quite a few points in the definition. What we want to see is how does the Bible use that term in other areas, and then come to that conclusion. In Psalms 139, verse 13, it says, For thou hast possessed my reins, thou hast covered me in my mother's womb. The word reins here can mean kidney or figuratively means the mind. So here it says that thou hast possessed my mind. There's other places where it is used. Psalm 7 verse 9, I will bless the Lord who hath given me counsel. My reins also instruct me in the night season. This gives the idea of the mind. Jeremiah 17 10, I, the Lord, search the heart, I try the reins, even to give every man according to his ways and according to the fruit of his doings. So God tries the mind. Let's evaluate some other passages and we'll get back to this. In Jeremiah 1 verse 5, it says, Before I formed thee in the belly, I knew thee, and before thou comest forth out of thy womb, I sanctify thee, and I ordain thee a prophet unto the nations. Here it says that God basically took control of Jeremiah. He knew him. He understood him. In verses 7 through 9, But the Lord said unto me, Say not, I am a child, for thou shalt go to all that I shall send thee. And whatsoever I command thee, thou shalt speak. Be not afraid of their faces, for I am with thee to deliver thee, saith the Lord. Then the Lord put forth his hand and touched my mouth. And the Lord said unto me, Behold, I have put words in thy mouth. Here it shows that God is taking control. So when God possessed David's reins, he controlled his mind as the lawful owner. David belongs to God. In Jeremiah 32 verse 15, the word is translated as possessed. For thus saith the Lord God of hosts, the God of Israel, houses and fields and vineyards shall be possessed again. Now here it's talking about us possessing these things. We may build these houses from material that already exists, so we're not creating them, but we will own them. The word also is translated as possessor in Genesis 14, verse 19 and 22. And he blessed him and said, Blessed be Abram of the Most High God, possessor of heaven and earth. So this same word, the Lord possessed me in the beginning of his ways, the word possessed here, again, is giving the idea of ownership as well. In Zechariah 11, verse 5, it's possessors. In Proverbs 1, verse 5, has a different translation. A wise man will hear and will increase learning, and a man of understanding shall attain unto wise counsel. So he shall reach this wise counsel. James 1, verse 5 shows us 
that this attaining is not something that one has naturally. It comes to them of God. If any of you lack wisdom, let him ask of God to give it to all men liberally and upbraideth not, and it shall be given him. So in this verse, a human being can attain to something. He can even own something, but God is the author of wisdom. In Genesis 25, verse 10, the word is translated as purchased. It says about Abraham, the field which Abraham purchased of the sons of Heth. There was Abraham buried and Sarah, his wife. And there's several other passages that the word is translated as purchased. So from the way that this word is being used, we can see it is translated as possessed, as giving ownership. It shows that it is purchased, something that someone purchases and owns. It is something that we attain. It's interesting that in the King James Bible, there is never a single reference where it is translated as create. And so to think that it says here about Jesus, the Lord created me in the beginning of his ways, we cannot use that term at all. God did not create Jesus. So we can read this translation as the Lord possessed or owned or purchased me in the beginning of his way. So God owned Christ in one sense here from the beginning of his way. Whose way? The his way here is talking about God. When is the beginning of God's way? When does God have a beginning? Well, quite obviously, God does not have a beginning. And so, Jesus Christ and God, it still shows, have the existence simultaneous together with each other. Let's go to verse 23 now. I was set up from everlasting, from the beginning or ever the earth was. Here is the word set up. It means to pour out or to cast like metal casting or another definition for it is to anoint a king. So let's keep these definitions in mind. So let's look at some of the words that it is used and translated as in other parts of the Bible. Let's begin with Psalm 2, verse 6. Yet have I set my king upon my holy hill Zion. The marginal reading for the word here, set, yet I have set my king upon my holy hill, is the word anoint. I have anointed my king upon my holy hill. In Exodus 25, verse 29, And thou shalt make the dishes thereof, and spoons thereof, and covers thereof, and bowls thereof, to cover with all of pure gold shalt thou make them. There are several other passages where the word is translated as cover. So in the sanctuary service, when they made something, they would cover it all up with gold. And so this word set up is translated in those cases as something to be covered. In Isaiah 30, verse 1, it says, Woe to the rebellious children, saith the Lord, that take counsel, but not of me that cover with a covering, but not of my spirit, that they may add to their sins. So again, they are covering something else up. That is the word set up. In Psalm 16, verse 4, it says, Their sorrows shall be multiplied that haste after another god. Their drink offering of blood will I not offer, nor take up the names into my lips. Here the word set up, the original Hebrew word is translated as offer. So something that is offered. Hosea 9 verse 4, the same thing. They shall not offer wine offering to the Lord, etc. So here it is showing that something is given up as a sacrifice. In Exodus 30 verse 9, Ye shall offer no strange incense thereon, nor burnt offerings, nor meat offerings, neither shall ye pour drink offerings thereon. So in this case here, it is to pour something. And again, several passages in Jeremiah, you find the same Hebrew word translated as pour. In Genesis 35, verse 14, And Jacob set up an altar in the place where he talked with him, even a pillar of stone, and he poured a drink offering thereon, and he poured oil thereon. Here again, the word is poured. 
So, so far we can read these verses and let's kind of summarize these verses or read them here. Proverbs 8, verse 22 and 23. The Lord possessed or owned or purchased me in the beginning of his way, in the Father's beginning that is, before his works of old. I was set up or anointed or poured out as an offering from everlasting or from the beginning or ever the earth was. So here, in reality, this shows that Jesus was anointed to be an offering from eternity in the past. That's what we're talking about here. Now we go to verse 24 and 25. When there were no depths, I was brought forth. When there were no fountains abounding with water, before the mountains were settled, before the hills was I brought forth. Now hear this word, brought forth, what does it mean? Well, let's look at the definition first, and then we'll evaluate the many different ways it is translated in the Bible. And what we'll do is we'll put them uh, together and summarize them to see what is this talking about. Brought forth means to twist or to whirl in circular or spiral manner means to dance, to writhe in pain and fear. And it goes on in several other different uh, particular meanings of that word. Let's take a look at some of the translations. Isaiah 45 verse 10. Woe unto him that saith unto his father, What begettest thou? Or to the woman, what hast thou brought forth? In this particular verse, what does it mean? A woman, when he says, what hast thou brought forth, what does it mean? What have you given birth to, right? And many times when we take a look at this word brought forth, we think of it in the case of being born. But let's look at the actual Hebrew word and see how it's translated in other places. Isaiah 23, verse 4. Be thou ashamed, O Zion, for the sea hath spoken, even the strength of the sea, saying, I travail not, nor bring forth children, neither do I nourish up young men, nor bring up virgins. Here the word is travail, brought forth is translated as travail, which is in the process of giving birth. Isaiah 66, 7 and 8, before she travaileth, she brought forth, before her pain came, she was delivered of a man child. Here again, before she travaileth, so here's the word travaileth. In Job 15, verse 20, also it's the word travaileth. 1 Samuel 31, verse 3. And the battle went sore against Saul, and the archers hit him, and he was sore wounded of the archers. Well, there's nothing here about giving birth here. But the word here is the word wounded. The word wounded is the same word translated there in Proverbs as brought forth. In chapter 13, verse 8. And they shall be afraid. Pangs and sorrow shall take hold of them. They shall be in pain... As a woman that travaileth, they shall be amazed one of another. Their faces shall be as flames. Here's the term pain. And the word pain is translated several times throughout the Bible. For example, in Isaiah chapter 26 and verse 17. Like as a woman with child that draweth near the time of her delivery is in pain. Here's the word pain. Ezekiel 30 verse 16 I will set fire in Egypt, sin shall have great pain, and no shall be rent asunder. Micah 4 verse 10, Be in pain and labor to bring forth, O daughter of Zion. Other places it is translated as pain. In Job 39 verse 1, Knowest thou the time when the wild goats of the rock bring forth, or canst thou mark when the hinds do calve? So here they're, they're bringing a calf into existence. Judges 21 verse 23. And by the way, I'm not reading all the text for each one. If you'd like all the text, you can uh, email us and we're going to go ahead and give you the notes so you can look at all the statements there. Or you can look in the, uh, on your computer concordance and just type in the Hebrew word and it'll give you all the references. In Judges 21 verse 23, and the children of Benjamin did so and took them wives according to the number of them that danced, whom they caught. Here is the word danced, is the same word translated. Proverbs 25, 23, the north wind driveth away rain. Here's the word driveth. First Chronicles 16, 30, 
fear before him all the earth. The world also shall be stable, that it be not moved. The word here is fear. Psalm 96, 9, O worship the Lord in the beauty of holiness, fear before him in all the earth. Deuteronomy 32, verse 18, Of the rock that begat thee, thou art unmindful, and hast forgotten God that formed thee. Here's the word formed, and there's several places for that. Ezekiel 30, verse 16, And I will set fire in Egypt, sin shall have great pain. Here is the word great in this particular case. Esther 4, verse 4, so Esther's maids and her chamberlains came and told it her. Then was the queen exceedingly grieved. So here is the process of grieving brought to view. Jeremiah 5 verse 3. O Lord, are not thine eyes upon the truth? Thou hast stricken them, but they have not grieved. Again, here's the word grieved. Psalm 10 verse 5. His ways are always grievous. The word grievous here. Jeremiah 23, 19. Behold, a whirlwind of the Lord is gone forth in fury. Even a grievous whirlwind, it shall fall grievously upon the head of the wicked. So, grievously is here. Lamentations 3, 26. It is good that the man should both hope and quietly wait for the Lord of salvation. Here is the word hope. Job 20, verse 21, There shall none of this meat be left, therefore shall no man look for his good. The word is look. 2 Samuel 3, verse 29, Let it rest on the head of Joab. Here is rest, or be placed upon the head of Joab. Psalm 29, verse 8, The voice of the Lord shaketh the wilderness, the Lord shaketh the wilderness of Kadesh. Here is the word shaketh. Psalm 51, 5, Behold, I was shapen in iniquity, and in sin did my mother conceive me. The word shapen. Jeremiah 51, 29, And the land shall tremble and sorrow, for every purpose of the Lord shall be performed against Babylon. Here's the word sorrow. In Zechariah 9, verse 5, it translated as sorrowful. Lamentations 4, verse 6, for the punishment of the iniquity of the daughter of my people is greater than the punishment of the sins of Sodom that was overthrown as in a moment and no hands stayed on her. The word stayed. Judges 3 verse 25, and they tarried till they were ashamed. Tarried in this case. Psalm 114 verse 7, Tremble thou earth at the presence of the Lord, at the presence of the God of Jacob. Habakkuk, 3 verse 10, the mountains saw thee and they trembled. Well, this may seem quite a list of verses. And there's many more verses that, that, that come with it. And I didn't read all these verses. But I do want to summarize the text here that we have looked at. Again, you need to look at the root word in Hebrew and then see how it is translated in other parts of the Bible. Three times... The word is used to mean born or calved. Three times. Six times it's translated to mean form or to make. In other words, of all the times that are written here, nine times have to do with making or birthing. Nine times that is written here. Four times we find it in pain during childbirth. It talks about the pain itself. Not the birth, but the childbirth pain. Travail. Nine times the word pain itself. It's translated. Sorrow or sorrowful, two times. Wounded, twice. Fear or tremble, six times. Grieve or grievous, five times. So having to do with pain, wound, or fear, or grief is 28 times. Only 9 times having to do with birthing, 28 times with wounding, fear, pain, something of that nature. Wait or stay was twice, which does not come in any of these categories. And once each was to dance, to push, to drive, great hope, look, rest, and shaketh. When we look at this, we find 
that particular verse that we're talking about. And I want to read it again here. When there were no depths, I was brought forth. When there were no foundations abounding with water, before the mountains were settled, before the hills was I brought forth. What it says here is that before anything was ever created, Jesus was brought forth in the terminology here. Majority of the cases, it has reference to being pained for something, having pain for something. Now, I want us to take a look at a pro another prophecy. And this prophecy, I want to look at what did it describe that Jesus was going to do? What is his responsibility, his role in the plan of redemption? And that is Isaiah chapter 53. In Isaiah 53, verse 3 and 4, it says, He is despised, he is rejected of men, a man of sorrows, and acquainted with grief. And we hid, as it were, our faces from him. He was despised, and we esteemed him not. Surely he had borne our griefs and carried our sorrows. Yet we did esteem him stricken, smitten of God, and afflicted. So here it shows that Jesus was going to be in a sorrowful situation. In Isaiah 53, verse 5, But he was wounded for our transgressions, he was bruised for our iniquities, the chastisement of our peace was upon him, and with his stripe he were healed. We talk about the endurance of pain. Isaiah 53, verse 6, he was oppressed and he was afflicted, yet he opened not his mouth. He is brought as a lamb to the slaughter and as a sheep before her shears is dumb, so he opened not his mouth. In Isaiah 53, verse 11, He shall see of the travail of his soul and shall be satisfied. So when we're looking at the word brought forth in the context of Isaiah 53, we can clearly see that this is the pain that deity had before anything was created. In Desire of Ages, 690 to 693. Just listen to these words in connection with this. The awful moment had come, the moment which was to decide the destiny of the world. This is speaking of the Garden of Gethsemane. The fate of humanity trembled in the balance. Christ might even now refuse to drink the cup apportioned to guilty man. It was not yet too late. He might wipe the bloody sweat from his brow and leave man to perish in his iniquity. He might say, let the transgressor receive the penalty of his sin, and I will go back to my Father. Will the Son of God drink the bitter cup of humiliation and agony? Will the innocent suffer the consequences of the curse of sin to save the guilty? The words fall tremblingly from the pale lips of Jesus. O oh, my Father, if this cup may not pass away from me except I drink it, thy will be done. Three times has he uttered that prayer. Three times his humanity shrunk from the last crowning sacrifice. But now the history of the human race comes up before the world's Redeemer. He sees that the transgressors of the law is left to themselves must perish. He sees the helplessness of man. He sees the power of sin. The woes and lamentations of a doomed world rise before him. He beholds the impending fate and his decision is made. He will save man at any cost to himself. He accepts the baptism of blood that through him perishing millions may gain everlasting life. He has left the courts of heaven where all is purity, happiness, and glory to save one lost sheep, the one world that has fallen by transgression. And he will not turn from his mission. He will become the propitiation of a race that is willed to sin. His prayer now breathes only submission. If this cup may not pass away from me except I drink it, thy will be done. Let's take a look at the experience of Jesus Christ in the Garden of Gethsemane as recorded in Matthew chapter 26, verses 36 through 44. Reading again from Desire of Ages. But now he seems to be shut out from the light of God's sustaining presence. Now he was numbered with the transgressors. The guilt of the fallen humanity he must bear. Upon him who knew no sin must be laid the iniquity of us all. So dreadful does sin appear to him. So great is the weight of guilt which he must bear that he is tempted to fear it will shut him out forever from his father's love. Feeling how terrible is the wrath of God against transgressors, he exclaims, my soul is exceeding sorrowful even unto death. Next page it says, as Christ felt his unity with the father broken up, he feared that in his human nature he would be unable to endure the coming conflict with the powers of darkness. In the wilderness of temptation, the destiny of the human race had been at stake. 
Christ was then conquered. Now the tempter had come for the last fearful struggle. When you look at the description of the suffering and sacrifice of Christ, we know that this suffering and sacrifice was made before anything was ever created. We can read these verses in Proverbs 8. The Lord possessed or owned or purchased me in the beginning of His ways. In the Father's beginning, remember? Before His works of old. I was set up or anointed or poured out as an offering from everlasting. From the beginning or ever the earth was. When there were no depths, I was brought forth or wounded or travailed in pain. When there were no fountains abounding with water. Before the mountains were settled, before the hills was I brought forth. Christ was anointed or set aside or poured out as an offering from the very beginning to be sacrificed for, the, for those needing redemption. Now what evidences do we have elsewhere in the Bible that this travail or this wounding took place from the very beginning back there in eternity? In Revelation 13, 8 it says, And all that dwell upon the earth shall worship him whose names are not written in the book of life of the Lamb slain from the foundation of the world. Before anything was created, Jesus emptied himself out for us. He was poured out as a sacrifice for those who he could foresee would sin. This we call the mystery of godliness. And without controversy, great is the mystery of godliness. God was manifested in the flesh, justified in the spirit, seen of angels, preached unto the Gentiles, believed on in the world, received up into the glory. What is this great mystery? That God was manifested in the flesh. What is the purpose of this mystery? The purpose of this mystery is that it must be told. Ephesians 3, verse 8 and 9. Unto me who am less than the least of all the saints is the grace given that I should preach among the Gentiles the unsearchable riches of Christ and to make all men see what is the fellowship of the mystery which from the beginning of the world had been hid in God who created all things by Jesus Christ. And verse 10, 11, To the intent that now unto the principalities and powers in heavenly places might be known by the church the manifold wisdom of God according to His purpose which He purposed in Christ Jesus our Lord. So this wisdom is to be revealed through the church, through the world. So Christ came into this world, revealed it to mankind, revealed it to his prophets, revealed it to his church, and from the church to be taken to the world. This is called the wisdom of God, 1 Corinthians 1, 23 and 24. But we preach Christ crucified unto the Jews a stumbling block, and unto the Greeks foolishness. But unto them which are called both Jews and Greeks, Christ the power of God and the wisdom of God. In Colossians 1, verse 27, it tells how the church is to reveal it to the world. It says, To whom God will make known what is the riches of the glory of this mystery among the Gentiles, which is Christ in you, the hope of glory. Christ in His people, the hope of glory. This people on earth, combining with their frail human nature, the divinity of Christ, are able to live a victorious life. That's the purpose of this whole message. In Revelation 18, verse 1, it says, And after these things I saw another angel come down from heaven, having great power, and the earth was lightened with his glory. The message of Christ's righteousness, according to volume 6, page 19, the message of Christ's righteousness is the sound from one end of the earth to the other to prepare the way of the Lord. This is the glory of God which closes the work of the third angel. We need to accept this in our life in order to be able to reveal it to the world. The only way we can accept it is by realizing that Christ, before anything was ever created, before anything ever went wrong, He foresaw this and He made provisions for it. Although this mystery is not fully revealed, Ephesians 1.9, having made known unto us the mystery of His will according to His good pleasure, which He had purposed in Himself, that which God saw fit, He revealed it according to His good pleasure. But soon this mystery will be over. It will come to an end. Revelation 10 verse 7. But in the days of the voice of the seventh angel when he shall begin to sound, the mystery of God should be finished, as he had declared to his servants the prophets. So the time is coming when this mystery will come to an end. This mystery was hid from the very beginning. 
Romans 16, 25. Now to him that is of power to establish you according to my gospel and the preaching of Jesus Christ according to the revelation of the mystery which was kept secret since the world began. The Revised Version says, was kept in silence through times eternal. This mystery was developed before anything was created. In Proverbs we see that Jesus offered himself. He poured himself out to be wounded for our transgressions. And that was a mystery that was kept secret and now is being revealed in the scriptures. In Desire of Ages, page 22, it shows us that this mystery was developed before anything was created. The plan for our redemption was not an afterthought. A plan formulated after the fall of Adam. It was a revelation of the mystery which had been kept in silence through times eternal. It was the unfolding of the principles that from eternal ages have been the foundation of God's throne. In studying those texts there in Proverbs, we can see that that was the foundation of God's throne from all eternity. From the beginning, God and Christ knew of the apostasy of Satan and of the fall of man through the deceptive power of the apostate. God did not ordain that sin should exist, but He foresaw its existence and made provision to meet the terrible emergency. So great was His love for the world that He covenanted to give His only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in Him should not perish, but have everlasting life. My dear friend, let's not misunderstand those verses in Proverbs. They're not talking about Christ being created, that Christ coming into existence. No, they are showing to us that this Savior of ours, who loves us so much, from the very beginning before sin ever entered the universe, He offered Himself as a sacrifice for you and me. He poured Himself on that altar of sacrifice. And the question for you and me today is, are you prepared right now to place yourself on the altar of sacrifice for Jesus so that we can spend eternity together? And the Lord help us that we may make that choice, that we may choose to walk with Him and spend eternity with our King. Amen. I have returned to the bed of my mother. I lay never most godlike man a child could know I just heard a shout from the angels in glory praising the Lord a child has come home I have returned Yeah.